Hey guys, it's Mrs. D and I wanted to take some time to go over and review some of the 2.2 questions that we worked on in class today. I want to look at in particular with the intramolecular forces and potential energy. So this is the worksheet that we went over in class and um, I just feel like some of you may need a little bit of extra or just to hear it again. So here we go. We're going to go over the five questions we went over in class, and I want you guys to continue. You were to continue um, after, like for your assignment tonight, to the back side, number six through eight. So let's look at number one. First off, we have draw representations of both ionic solids in each set that show the relative differences in size of the four ions. Um, so this is a big thing that we want to really look at with the sizes. And so let's take a look at... Na and Cl, and let me write on here for you here. So you have Na and Cl, and once they ionize, here's the part that I want to make sure we understand. And this is where um, I did kind of like my oops video to show you guys. Um, but if you think about this with Na and Cl, Na has 11 protons, but if it loses one, it looks very much like neon. Where if chlorine gains one, it looks very much like argon. So argon is in the third energy level and neon's in the second energy level. So if we were to draw this, our larger particulate is actually going to be the chlorine and our smaller one is going to be um, the sodium. So as we draw this, and I'm just going to draw like a quick version of it, um, I think the question asks you to draw these formula units. Um, they don't make the the perfect. So they do want you to have the right ratio, as in with Na and Cl, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. But in this case, the, the larger ones are going to be negative, and then the smaller ones are going to be positive. So here's your particular diagram that you're going for. Now, um, what we need to do, though, is identify which ionic solid will have a higher melting temperature and justify your answer. So I'm going to go ahead, and for the first one, I'm just going to draw KBr as well. And KBr is a whole nother energy level. So um, again, Br will be a little bit larger because they are on the same energy level. So, but they, uh, this Br has to be a little bit drawn a little bit bigger than the Cl and the K has to be drawn a little bit bigger than the Na um, over in the other picture because you want to compare like all the sizes together. Okay, so I'm just going to draw this and then actually our anion is going to be the larger one because bromine is going to behave like a larger atom. Okay, because of the energy level itself. So now here's where it comes in where I'm looking at the two and I want to identify which ionic solid will have the higher melting temperature and we need to justify our answer. So I look and I have to relate this to Coulomb's law, good old Coulomb's law, right? So if we relate it to Coulomb's law, we're going to look at, we have the energy or the force is going to be equal to our Q and our Q is going to be our plus charge and our minus charge divided by the distance or the internuclear distance between the, the elements themselves. So what we want to look at here is that for both of these, Na and K are both in um, their alkali metals and Cl and Br are halogens. So their charges are all going to be equal, meaning that um, Q, we have a plus one, Q, we have a minus one. You take like the absolute value. So if you find the charges of both sets of these, we're going to have a total of two being our Q on the top. Now our distance, however, the distance is going to change because K and Br are larger elements atomic radius wise. And so because they're larger, there's going to be more distance from the electrons to the nuclei of the next one. So if the distance is greater and the Q is smaller, then therefore um, the bonding energy is going to be, okay, it's going to be smaller with the distance being greater. So for a KBR. Um, so it's going to require more energy then to overtake or to tear apart NaCl. And so um, we, in order to have the higher melting point, then NaCl is going to have the higher melting point between the two. And that's relating it to Coulomb's law. 
Now I want to show, I'm not going to draw a particulate diagram for all of these, but I want to show you part B with Coulomb's law in particular. So if you think about this for Coulomb's law, for NaCl, we're going to have a plus one and a minus one. So our Q is a two, so we keep that in mind. And the MgS we're going to have um, a plus 2 and a minus 2. So actually our Q is 4. So our Q is larger for MgS and smaller for NaCl. And they're all in the same energy level. Since all of these atoms are in the same energy level, therefore MgS is the distance is the same. So let's just call the distance 1, for example. MgS is going to have a larger energy or like it'll be larger for Coulomb's law. So with the larger energy, it's going to take more to melt it. So MGS is going to have a higher melting point. So I want you to just take a minute and stop the video real quick and put it on pause and just kind of go over in your head which ones have the higher melting point for C, D, and E. So just put it on pause. All right. So now I want us to look at, between these, um, BEF2 is going to have a higher melting point because the Q is going to be larger, okay? LI and BE are in the same energy level, but BE has a 2 plus charge and LI only has a 1 plus charge, making the Q larger when looking at Coulomb's law. Part D, we have CAO actually having a higher melting point. And again, it has to do with the Q's being larger. We have um, a two plus charge and a two minus charge, and we have a two plus charge and a one minus charge. So our Q's are larger, even though they're on the same energy level. And finally, right here, again, it goes back to our Q, where we have higher charges. Aluminum has a plus three charge, oxygen a minus two charge, total of five on the charges, where we have two and two with magnesium and oxygen. So it all goes back to with ionic solids, it goes back to Coulomb's law, so that then we know how much energy is holding that together. And if there's a lot of energy holding it together, it takes more energy to break it apart. Let's take a look at the next one. Number two says rank the following single bonds in order of increasing bond length. So we're gonna again look at size of um, the actual atomic radius. Now in this case, we have all nonmetals, okay? So we have covalent bonds because we're looking at bond length. You're only gonna look at bond length when you're working with covalent bonds. If you're working with ionic, you're looking at the distance, the internuclear distance. So there's kind of a little bit of a difference there. Um, again, you would not use Coulomb's law to discuss covalent compounds at all because Coulomb's law, that Q means charge. And remember, we don't use charges when we're working with just nonmetals. So taking a look at this, so we're gonna, we are looking at size. And when we look at atomic size, we know that fluorine is the smallest. So that means fluorine can actually be, it's gonna be held closer to the oxygen. So our first one or our smallest is going to be the OF. Okay, so that's going to be our smallest bond length, and it's going to be like the bond length that's the most difficult to break. The second one is going to be um, OO. Okay, and that's a diatomic. So that's next, and then we just work our way down the line. So we have then ON and OC. So OC is going to have the largest bond length. Okay, and the reason is, again, is simply because of the distance between. And so um, carbon is a larger atom than nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Looking at the next question, which bond from each set has the greatest bond energy? Okay, so again, we're looking at covalence, and you can also tell their covalence because in part D, you have a double bond. Ionic bonds will not have double and triple bonds. Okay, so um, NO to NF, which one has the greatest bond energy? So what we want to do is we want to look at the, which one has, oops, sorry, which one has the smaller, oh my gosh, I can't write you guys, which one has the smaller atomic radius? So if we think about smaller atomic radii between the two, then that's going to equal a smaller bond length 
And if you have a smaller bond length, then there's going to be a greater bond energy because it's going to be more difficult to get it apart. And that's why you have to think about how easy is it to break these bonds. So we have a greater bond energy. So it's going to take quite a bit of energy to break these bonds apart. Um, the ones with the greatest bond energy. So we look at the two between NO and NF. And since F is smaller than O um, atomic radius wise, this is going to have the smallest bond length, therefore a greater bond energy. Between BF and BCL, um, again, F compared to CL, smaller length, greater bond energy. Take a minute, pause the video, and just go over in your head C, D, and E, and wrap, that, wrap your brain around that. Okay, let's look at these. Um, between B, C, and O, F, again, we're looking at basically the distance or the size, and O, F is going to be smaller in size. Now with part D, we're not necessarily looking at size because we have carbon and oxygen for both of them. However, we look at the single bond versus the double bond. And the double bond, because there's more electrons being shared, it's going to be a smaller bond length because there's more shared and it's a tighter bond. Therefore, it'll have greater bond energy. And finally, we have PBr versus PCl. And chlorine, again, is smaller than bromine. So therefore smaller bond length, greater bond energy. Let's look at number four. So which bond from each set is the longest? Now, when you have single versus double, those are super easy to tell, but now we're just looking basically at the opposite here. So we're looking at the longest bond length. So first off for A, between a single and a double bond, we know singles only share two electrons, whereas doubles share four electrons. So therefore the um, single bond will have the longest bond length. For the second one, we know that fluorine is smaller than nitrogen, so therefore um, boron and nitrogen will have a longer bond length. Take just a minute, pause the video, and try C and D, and just kind of think those through your brain. And let's look at these. So we have silicon and oxygen versus silicon and iodide. So silicon and iodine um, is a whole nother energy level than oxygen, or actually two energy levels. So it's going to be quite a bit bigger. It's going to have two more energy levels of electrons. So therefore, silicon with iodine will be the longest bond. And then we have um, carbon with chlorine and carbon with fluorine. And chlorine, as we know, is, is larger than fluorine. So therefore carbon is going to bond with that and it'll have the longest bond. Finally, let's look at number five to kind of wrap it up. And now we're looking at space filling models. So it's not like stick models like we kind of had before, but these space filling models can kind of like indicate also um, size and charge and all that good stuff. So we want to look at which structure has the longest bond lengths. And of course we need to justify our answer for everything. So the longest bond lengths, well, that's going to be the largest atom or the largest atoms in the bond. So which one's bigger? Well, clearly it's the second one. So number two. And to justify our answer, the number two is larger because it has larger radii. So simply because of the larger radius, um, we're going to have a greater bond length. Now, part B says, which structure has the greatest bond energy between the central and the terminal atoms? Terminal atoms, terminal means end. So terminal atoms are just those atoms around the base of the um, molecule itself. So again, the greatest bond energy is going to be the first one because it's smaller. And to justify our answer, it's going to be it's smaller and the atomic radii is smaller. Therefore, um, in the nuclei are closer together. The internuclear distance is closer. And number C, which structure has the least potential energy associated with its bonds? So remember, potential energy is that energy that just like it's holding, it's in a holding pattern. It's keeping things where it's supposed to be. There's no movement yet. But that is going to be the least potential energy will be the first one again. 
And that's because as the um, valence electrons of, of one approaches the valence electrons of the other, um, the bond is shorter um, in number one. So because we have these shorter bonds here, so these electrons are like, ooh, I'm attracted to this nucleus, and these electrons are attracted to this nucleus and so forth from all over, but they're shorter, and so because they're shorter, they have um, a higher bond energy, which actually means less potential energy. So I want you guys now to finish numbers six through eight. And if you need some extra help, go ahead and look at the PowerPoint that is included on Schoology as well. So you can um, get some more information on bond length. And we went over that in class a little bit today too. All right, guys, take care.